and then they measured them and they found these effects but they couldn't explain that is the theory didn't explain it quantitatively because when the people made the calculation they got infinity instead of the right result as an example a, an electron in a magnetic field precesses at a certain rate and the rate according to Dirac was a certain amount but when you, he didn't take into account the interaction of electricity and light, and when he took it into account, we knew that the answer should be wrong. Let's say that Dirac's answer was right, but when experiment was made, it came out not to be one, but to be a little bit more. Uh, this number here, the experimenters weren't good enough to tell us exactly. It's somewhere between five and 21 here. We write it as eight plus or minus <laughs> three as the next digit. That means this is not measured accurately. So in 19, uh, I'm sorry, by 1948, 20 years, we had at last measured something which showed that the original theory was without interaction, is incomplete. This is supposed to be the result of interaction. When you went to calculate it, you got infinity. So there was a very strong effort made then in 1948 because of the fact that experiments were showing such accuracy to try finally to get that theory straightened out. And it turned out, surprisingly, it was worked out more or less independently by three guys who got Nobel Prizes, of one of which you see here. And uh, uh, Professor Swinger, that's not me, but the other one of the other ones, first worked out a correct way. We, we found out that the original theory that was written in 1929 by Heisenberg and Dirac and Pauli was very nearly correct. And the problem was that there was something wrong with the way they handled uh, doing the calculations, and we straightened it out. And then we could do calculations. And Schwinger, for example, calculated this and found out that it was something like this, theoretically. And that was a tremendous achievement. It's a great excitement. Because that meant we really understood some more, some more subtle details, and that the original theory of Heisenberg and Dirac and so on were fundamentally, was fundamentally right, just a little switch on how you calculated things. Now this is the theory, then, that we're going to talk about. This theory has lasted now for 50 years. Uh, 30, 50 years, 30 years. <laughs> I can't add, from 1979, 1949. Oh, it's 50 years, yes, from the time that Dirac and, and Heisenberg wrote it, and it took 20 years to figure out how to calculate with it. Then the remaining 30 years, the methods of calculations improved, they calculated things much more accurately, and the experimenters became more and more adept at measuring things. And this particular rate that they uh, measured in 1948 to here, now in 1979, has been measured to be, in fact, 100-1159-6524, and the four may not be four. It could be <laughs> somewhere between two and six. After all, the more you write it, the somewhere you have to stop, right? And this, I write to show you the tremendous achievement of experimenters during the last 30 years in order to test with the precision the correctness of the theory. In the meantime, poor guys using calculators and sweating and writing marks on pieces of paper so I'm calculating the results of the theory under the same circumstances for the same phenomena produce the predicted value that it should be 6523 within minus, plus or minus 3. Why should the theories have a plus or minus? Well, they get exhausted in computing <laughs> the number of decimal places that they need to to keep up with experiments. There are, this is not atypical. There are two or three or four perhaps uh, different places where it's been measured and checked to that degree of accuracy. This degree of accuracy, that number of decimal places, corresponds to a precision something like this. If you were measuring the distance to, of me to the moon, the question would come up, do you mean from my chin or from the top of my head? The difference between whether it's from the chin or the top of my head to the moon is the plus and minus two on the end of that number in proportion, all right? That is uh, to intimidate you that the theory is correct uh, in high accuracy. I have, don't need to produce a large number of other experimental results. They all have this feature. It is remarkable that at this time it is possible to say that there's no experimental discrepancy known between the predictions of the theory anywhere and the uh, results of experiment. It doesn't mean we can compute everything. The rules 
of the game by which we make the computation, the laws underneath everything that makes nature work, are simple. That doesn't mean we can really figure everything out. To give an example, suppose you play the game of checkers. I think you call it checkers here, maybe draughts, something. <laughs> The rules of the game are very simple. The way the pieces move is simple. And if you want to make it even simpler, make the rule no kings, but when you come to the end of the board, you start at the beginning. It doesn't make any difference. The rules are simple. But imagine a checkerboard with 100 million piece squares on each side. Now, hundreds of millions of these checkers in different positions moving through the board, taking pieces and being taken from the other. Which way are they going to swirl? Which way is the game going to go? Of the rules that's involved, but the multiplicity of its action and interconnections. The matter, as you all know, be made, is made out of atoms and all this stuff, is such a multitude of little particles that in ordinary circumstances, so much is happening that in spite of the fact that the rules are relatively simple, not quite as easy as the checker rules, but pretty easy, it still is very difficult in almost all circumstances to figure out what could happen exactly. Well, when we can't figure it out exactly, but can do a pretty good job of approximating, the phenomenon is in the range that we expect. When we have a situation that's sufficiently simple, a corner of the board where there's only a few pieces, then we can compute exactly what ought to happen, and when we do experiments in those circumstances, it fits exactly. And that's all we can say at the moment about this theory. This uh, theory has been designed, was originally designed in the ideas of space and time and a geometrical framework. And the question is, how small a scale can we go down to? And during the time of this, this period of time, we not only me tried to measure accuracy, but also tried to see how small a distance the theory would be correct at. And I can only tell you that distance is 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. That means point zero, 15 zeros before you get to 14 zeros, before you get to a first digit of distance in centimeters we, that thing is that act. We know that the laws are that accurate. To put it another way, it used to be thought that atoms were small. That was a limit of measurement. But uh, at the present time, with the new instruments and divine during all this time, we've been able to make instruments that can test this theory down to distances that could be described this way. If the atom is made 100 kilometers on a side, then we're measuring with one centimeter accuracy inside. So the theory is right. The distances correspond to a centimeter when an atom is 100 kilometers. So altogether, I can only emphasize with delight and excitement the fact that so much of nature is so accurately describable by one theory. There's enormous range of phenomena. All the things you ordinarily see, the best way to describe what the phenomena are, colors of things, this softness of materials, the weight of things, the way their temperature, when you change the temperature, how much heat it takes, and sounds, and a whole of these phenomena. Yet the only best way to describe it is to describe the phenomena that are not included in this theory. And one of them is the accelerations produced by gravity. The force of gravity is in another theory, gravitational theory, or general relativity. Another range of phenomena that have to do with exciting the interior of nuclei uh, nuclear physics, uh, protons and neutrons, radioactivity, and nuclear phenomena. That excluded all the rest of the phenomena of nature are contained in this one theory. Now you can see why it is that I feel a bit uncomfortable when con someone asks to give a talk, please tell us the latest things, because then I'm talking about our problems that we have in trying to understand the insides of a proton. For example, for a proton, to tell you a contrast, our understanding, of the outside of the atoms, the electrons and light that I'm going to talk about, the theory is our jewel and great achievement to the things that people ordinarily have to talk about at these lectures. It's as follows. You take the corresponding number for a proton. I don't remember it. It starts at 273, I think 19. I'm not sure. Or is it 2719? I don't remember. And it goes on for a number of decimal places because the experiment that can measure it so well. Now we have a theory of the protons recently developed involving quarks and so on. We can't make any calculations yet. We haven't developed the technique good enough. So the best I could say, really, and probably exaggerating, is that the theory does say that this number should be around three 